viewers. Uh, welcome to uh, Mark and Elmer's PSI, uh, Piano Scene Investigations. Uh, had a long week. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, I walked into uh, Mark's front door today and I'm sniffing a little bit. Sniffles. I mean, it's been going around this these last few weeks. I've had friends who are out with a, a really bad cough and some of the flu, and I've had uh, lessons canceled from some of my students because they're out too. So, which gave me some time to clean up the archives. So, oh. which um, sort of kicked in my um, allergies a little bit. And you know, every once in a while. Uh, you know, a local piano teacher decides they want to retire and they want to know what to do with their stuff, which, you know, one of these days, I guess I might have to decide what am I going to do with all of my stuff. Yeah, I'm going to die and leave it to somebody else to, to decide. To decide. <laughs> Sometime, I keep sort of promising this, but I take the camera on a little journey around the library. Oh, I've got yeah. a lot, I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not a hoarder. It's very beautifully arranged and everything. And there's enough room for all of it. But um, you know, I've lived abroad so many different times and been separated from a lot of my belongings, necessarily. Um, then when I finally moved back to the United States, and I've been here since 2012, finally got all my stuff that was still here out of storage yeah. and. Uh, it's just nice to have it around, you know. I, I feel, I'm, I'm pretty sure people have told me that in past lives I was like a monk and was like a, like a Merlin, like, you know, yeah. tucked away with his books and everything. And I've always felt really comfortable and safe. Yeah. I, I, I don't mean I don't feel not safe, but it just feels very comfortable to be surrounded by books. It's almost like the magic, the knowledge. The voices of all of these incredible human beings, you know, and then the recordings. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, but, anyways, uh, I was just saying, you know, we have local piano teachers that will retire and they want to get rid of their stuff. Uh, so, and on occasion, they'll give me a call and see if I want any of their stuff. And so I just go over to their places and I'll just pick up, you know, one, two, maybe three boxes of material that they want to get rid of. And, you know, not all of it is, you know, is, I don't know. You got a fireplace? <laughs> yeah, we never use it though. So, but anyways, I did find some things here. Okay. I'm not sure if you remember from one of our past, um, Episodes. I well, did show because there's only two of them. Up on oh yeah, the internet so far. We're I'm, we're trying a new thing now. Um, we're going to keep it shorter. Yeah, we'll try to. Um, we'll try. Well, we had lots of uh, technical mishaps to begin with because we're old guys who did not grow up with computers. No, we did. We were already kind of set with life as they started to come around. Yeah. But um, we're going to try to keep them a little shorter and keep the, so it's a little easier to edit them uh, and get them up on YouTube. So uh, I'm hoping, I was ill this past week with getting over a really bad head cold. Um, I slept a lot when I wasn't necessarily having to do things, snorting and gagging and everything. But fortunately, it really didn't move into my chest. But um, I think I can get the last week one that we did um, edited and up, and I should be able to do this one. I want to try to stay on track and do it every week. Okay. So I can do it. It's just, um, I have to re listen to all of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's uh, interesting. Okay. So, anyways, here's what I found. Uh, if you recall, that I brought in a, a book. With photograph, photographs of uh, famous composers. They had, they were, I mean, they even had Brahms in it, Bruckner and Mahler and all, and Strauss. So. Anyways, here's one that's got uh, photographs of 
opera stars, opera singers from the past. Uh, here's one with conductors. I was real excited to see this one. Uh, and here's one with instrumentalists. I don't know if you can tell. Can you figure who this guy is? Is that Casals? Casals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's Pablo Casals. So, anyways, that's what I found. Um, we have, we're, we've discovered, we, we've known, well, we kind of knew about each other for a long time. Oh, yeah. You knew more about me earlier yeah. than I did, but uh, since we were teenagers, really. Yes. And he yes. grew up in Finley, north of Springfield. Um, and it turns out that we have very similar uh, musical backgrounds, aspirations, yeah. and uh, acquisitions and access to things. It's yeah. all very similar. Very so similar. I have all three of these books yeah. as well. Um, I was going to say a thing about the opera. Yeah. Uh, stars. Yeah. Um, this is really cool because there's a lot of this wonderful singing. And this is back in the 19th century, it starts out. That's, um, I think this is Leonard Warren on the front. Here. Leonard is, Warren? Is it? I don't know. What's it say on the front of this piece of the book? Well, I, think, I think it's him uh, as the Duke. Um, in real life, though. But um, I was just going to say, I was thinking, you know, this is, this makes it a little bit more PG, but there's some great looking singers in here, depending on your sexual orientation. Yeah. Um, there was an American singer back in the mid 20th century, Blanche Tabom. And uh, woo, woo. And how about yeah. Anamofo? Oh, yes, I Ooh. remember Anna Moffa. <laughs> yes, Anna Moffa. Uh, and, um, oh, what was her name? I'd, I'll try to think of it. She was uh, Eastern European. She's famous for doing it. Oh, no, but that's an Italian. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and I, 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 I told this story. I don't know if it ever got up on one of the videos we actually loaded up. But, you know, I was a real geek in high school and I had certain privileges because I ended up being the salutatorian and, you know, teachers would let me roam the halls with, you know, if I had a pass and stuff. And I'd go to the library uh, just to, you know, say, can I go to the library and look at things? Well, part of it was because I found the book <laughs> on opera. It was on the shelves. And... Um, there was a picture in it, and it was of a Rimsky-Korsakov opera. I think it might have been the Golden Cockerel. Mm -hmm. But there was a black and white picture up in the right uh, upper part of the page. Yeah. And um, this, for whatever reason, the soprano was topless in their opera. So they were hanging out. Say that again. Whoa, wait. How old is this picture? No, I mean, this is an older book. I was in this high, high school in the mid-70s. So, and the book was older than that. And it was a history of opera, you know, and all that. I know that they didn't know that this was in there. And, of course, I was probably the only one that ever pulled it off the shelf. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> so I take it into a back carol. Now, I didn't do anything I get the picture and just take a look and get my jaw. So, there's a lot of good stuff. Now, the conductors, um, they weren't so handsome in the past. No. <laughs> Some of them. Um, the instrumentalist is very interesting, especially with the instrumentalists. There's a lot of people in there that you may never have heard of, but you know, they had careers that were significant. I was perusing through this book earlier, and I'm trying to find a picture of. Look at the index. The uh, yeah. I, I don't know, maybe it, maybe I might be able to find it faster here. I'm I don't sure. know if that is Leonard Warren. It could be Tito Gobi. I'm not sure. There's a lot of makeup on him in the. There she is, page seven. You gonna show them? Yeah, hold on. I'll show you picture. Let me tell you, there is that's that's her. Oh. Page seven. Oh. Hold on. Emmy? I was looking for 
Pauline oh. Viardo. Oh, yeah, Pauline Viardo. She was one, uh, she pretty much Robert Schumann's favorite singer. Yeah. She sang his leader. She was a very famous bel canto period but opera singer. I don't think that's her, though. Let me see. It's at page seven, and I can't find um, It's not on there. No, that's not her. That's not her. Oh. Anyways, I wanted to look up Pauline Viardo because I saw her in this book earlier. I want I should have put a Ah, this is Tito Gobi, the guy on the front of the book. I was right, it's not letter words, Tito Gobi. But let me see. Okay, but anyways, I brought in a score uh, months ago and it was uh, a rendition or arrangement of some of Chopin's mazurkas for soprano and piano. Yeah. Remember, and yeah. it was quite it was quite remarkable because uh, the uh, the note said that uh, Chopin used to accompany her, you know, it's for some of these songs. So I thought it was very enlightening. Yeah, there's a mistake in that. It says page seven, right? There's no mention of her, and I thought maybe it just mentions her name, but yeah. no, she's not here. But why don't you just show them some of the pictures? Okay. These are old timey people. Yeah. There's Lily and Nordica. There's a few people who are just examining yeah, this. Okay. This is great photographs yeah. of all these people. Yeah. This is published by. Dover. Dover. Yeah. Dover. Yeah. And they're still available. I mean, I actually bought the conductor one, I think, uh, within the last couple of years on Amazon or Thrift Books or something like that. Yeah. Uh, somewhere. But nice to have Dover still does have a lot of stuff available. Oh, yeah, they do. When I first started to build my music score library, I pretty much went in there and bought a lot of what they had available mm -hmm. brand new back in my doctorate, I think. Yeah. And one of my relatives gave me some money and I invested in just having tangibly, you know, the bulk of piano yeah. repertoire on hand. Yeah. And a lot of them are, you know, perfectly good historic and historically significant in some cases, additions of the oh, music. Yeah. Schumann's music, for example, the three books that they have of all his music yeah. is an early uh, edition which was edited by his wife. Yeah. You know, who was quite a pianist herself. Yeah. So, and I've got some Beethoven sonatas with Schinker, yeah. but then I also have Beethoven sonatas with uh, the list of Hans, oh, Hans oh, von Bülow. Yeah, Bülow. And his, his uh, edition is very interesting because he has lots of suggestions and comments and things uh, in the editions, you know, ideas about stuff. And this raises, uh, I'm just uh, off the side, this could be something we can talk about, okay. uh, possibly. I don't know what you had in mind, but just the one that pops up. We did talk about this. I don't think we talked about it last week, but we did talk about it in the show that we had recorded last year, which still hasn't been released. But um, the idea of or texts uh, yeah. and how useful those really are for naive, uninformed, and undeveloped pianists, you know, how far along they get. Is it better for them to work from a, um, a, a, an edition which is edited by a significantly talented and knowledgeable pianist? Yeah. You know, Earl Wilde yeah. did some of the selected list pieces. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's two volumes, I think. Mm -hmm. There are. A lot of the famous pieces, repertoire wise. Oh, yeah. But I played the second ballad a long time in my career. And I have the list edition. I think I started out probably with the Peters edition. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I found the list edition when I was in Europe. But then, uh, after I've been playing it for some time, I. I uh, found the Earl Wilde editions, and he has the second ballad, one of those two volumes. Yeah. 
some very interesting ideas about very interesting. Uh, what to add or do something, make some changes and things. And I play kind of my own reading of it. I don't mean just interpretation, but I change things in it as well, which I think is always okay with less. Oh, yeah, with less. Yeah, um, absolutely. You can flash it up. But there's a couple of ideas that I kind of took from from a little while I thought, well, this is mm -hmm. clever. You know, nice oh, yeah. It. So, I mean, as opposed to giving it a vortex, you know, nothing there except the original, original. original intentions of the composer, as far yeah. as we know, you know, having done, and I thank God, you know, there's that kind of scholarship and people have been able to dig Steve up and they're knowledgeable enough they can do that, but what does it mean to a a younger pianist. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking even undergraduate. Oh, yeah. I mean, how much do they really know? Uh, of course, we're talking from an American perspective. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's the training is different in Europe uh, in some ways, but and it's not like we're all corn soap doodads here. Uh, I mean, Elmer and I, we were really pursuing everything we'd get oh, our hands yeah. on when we were boys, you know, trying to find stuff out. But nonetheless, we weren't in New York City. No, we weren't. <laughs> so we were necessarily um, naive or uninformed just simply because of where we lived. Yeah. Uh, and what we had access yeah. to. We did what we could. Although <laughs> in Springfield, I was very lucky because there were some extraordinarily cultured and educated yeah. people. Um, I have some things in my library that I either inherited or was able to purchase in a few cases where there was some are there famous citizens who passed? I remember Dr. Wynn, yeah, my Wynn. first important piano teacher at Wittenberg. I started when I was 14. I had some others before that, but he was my first professor teacher. And I was with him for six years. He took me and another student or two with him. Now, he'd already been there before, so he got his hands on the best stuff. <laughs> but he knew that I was interested in art, art books and music and various things like that. And there was a fellow in the community who had passed, and he had a really decent collection of things. Yeah. And I have some things that I had purchased from that estate. Um, there's some music stuff. I remember in particular, I probably have it on the shelves right here somewhere, but it's a history of, what's it called? Well, um, it's the shadow puppetry of... Um, Oh, of uh, uh, it, the, Ch the Chinese Balinese. Or, oh, Balinese. The Balinese okay. shadow puppetry. Right. Walong, Gulong, or something like that. Yeah. Walong Gang or something. Um, beautiful book, picture yeah. book with all kinds of things. I just got it because it was so exotic and so different. Now, at the time, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, but anyway, we're getting off on the. That's okay. Another what you call it. But no, 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 no. Good thing to talk about, and this might be something. You might want to comment on what do you think about the idea of um, I mean that's it I, I mean I happen to mention uh, Hans von Bülow's edition of the Beethoven yeah um, one would say oh well that's very old-fashioned you don't he was a student yeah. of list and say, okay but how many of you guys can play like Hans von Bülow yeah I, I can't I can't either I certainly can't do the stuff he notoriously did by memory oh yeah come on he had his orchestra members memorize yeah, the, the music. music. The orchestra members. They had to play uh, by memory. Yeah. New York Philharmonic, Boston. Oh. He, prepared <laughs> the, he prepared the Tchaikovsky concerto over here. Yes, he did. It was written for Nikolai Rubinstein, Rubinstein. dedicated to Rubinstein's brother. Yeah. And he wouldn't play it. He said it was unplayable. Yeah. And so Tchaikovsky turned to von Bülow, and he gave the premiere in New York, or uh, Boston. Yeah. Was, with Tchaikovsky conducting. Conducting, right? yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, a colleague of mine told me that uh, there are early versions of the Tchaikovsky concerto. Uh -huh. And he says they, and they have been performed. And so it's very, he says it would uh, do a lot of people who intend to learn the concerto to listen to the older version uh -huh. to get an idea of, you know, what some of the intentions were. I think You'll be, I, you know, I mean, heard a recording so, of an alternate version. What was that guy, that American German pianist Michael, somebody that was famous for doing all of that? He, he had his career mostly in Europe, and he did okay. 
all these concerti by these Ponti, Michael, Michael Ponti. Ponti, yeah, Michael Ponti, P O N T I, yeah. His dad was an American military I, guy, I, right? I, I don't know. And his mom story. was German. Okay. Um, but he, I think he had a little time in the states, but he mostly yeah. was raised in, in Europe and had a big career there. Oh yeah. I think he's dead now. Probably. I, I mean, he was, well, he's at least up there in years. I used to um, own a lot of his recordings. Well, one of the things I yeah, so I have oh, some my. some albums, but especially old cassette tapes. Used to be able to go down to a book. What is it? The book loft in German Village. Yeah, and they had this section where they had. Uh, they still do. Yeah, not as much as they used yeah. to, but uh, classical recordings and back. They have recordings days, at the book loft. Yeah, they still have some things. Oh, gosh, I'm missing out. I, 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 I showed you some stuff a while back. Yeah, but I guess it's I was on a things. book loft. Oh, my gosh. I should yeah. have. I should have done well, it. I had a table that we cleaning out this last summer. Yeah. I showed you some of the stuff. I got yeah, you like, did. Uh, but I did that All those time. woodwind uh, ensemble things by, uh, what was his name? Reinecke. Oh, Reinecke? Reinecke yeah. or something like that. But yeah, Reingold or Some Reingold. different composers and things like that. But yeah. back in the day, like one of the things I have, and it is available, an expanded yeah. version of it now on yeah. CD, which it's still like around 50 bucks and I don't really want to pay full price wow. for it. But it's French piano concertos. Yeah. A oodles of them by, yeah. you know, Massenet and... Uh, Lalo and various, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, all those 20th Lalo, century guys, 20th century guys as well, Mio, and of course the Pulak is in there as well. But um, I have it on, uh, one, two, three, four, I think it's three or four compact er, no, uh, cassettes, double sided. Mm -hmm. I made the you did. CDs for you. Yeah, of it. you did. Uh, and it was really cool because. Oh, I wanted to talk about something else I just yeah. saw, too, in the news. I did not know this existed. This is very dangerous for me to know about this, because I'm kind of a collector sometimes. Oh, can't you're help, being dangerous in that sense. Can't help, can't help myself. <laughs> well, we've been, we just finished right. watching the entire TV series of Monk, but, the okay. detective, yeah. you know, and he was very compulsive and all that. Well, I... I get it. I know from my dad. From my dad, he definitely yeah. was upset. You know those people who would like line things up, you know, around yeah. him and stuff. I'm not quite that bad, but I do have my aspect. And <laughs> Laura reminds my partner reminds me of it all the time because she says I always compliment. Her. I say, oh, the house looks so beautiful and so wonderful and everything. And she just simply says, Yeah, I know because that's the way you wanted. If it wasn't that way, I'd never. Oh. <laughs> okay. Which I don't think is true, but so. What but did you find? what I found uh, recently, I sent you a text about it. Okay, the uh, Hyperion, Hyperion label. Yes, you did. Has been creating a set. They are in the eighties. Yes, I know. I'm waiting for them to create the major box box set, set so you can get it all in one. So, yeah. But it's going to take a while because they're selling them singly. Yeah, they are. They have piano concertos. By all every possible, every guy yeah. that would have been a pianist or a composer in the 19th century. I think historically, it's a really wonderful. Howard Shelley yeah. is one of the pianists yeah. who contributes to oh, yeah. the series. Stephen Hoff. But I too. mean, there's ones that you could think of, like Paderewski, Charlotte, and yeah. some of those people like that. But then there's all these other people, English, French, German, yeah. Italian, uh, Scandinavian yes. composers. Some of whom we know, but yeah. basically their stuff is not... It's not well known. It's well, it's just of it is. not, if not, not known at all. Yeah. And could just forgotten because they were, you know, second tier and third tier yeah. people. Yeah. In, in their own time, they were important in doing things, but, yeah. you know, time has a way of grinding things down yeah. to the only certain ones that stand up. Yeah. Well, Simon and Cyrus always said that we uh, pianists of our world today have only touched maybe a tenth of the pianist pianist repertoire. Well, I, and, and, I, that. and I'm I'm happy because I'm old and known and so yeah. forth. And I like to dig around and look at at stuff which the lesser known is lesser known. Yeah. I, in my, in my recitals, way. generally, I'll play some things that the audience would like to hear, of course. Yeah, and then I'll bring in some stuff that they. 
don't know, and I just feel it's worth hearing, you know. Oh, this is some good stuff. And some people sometimes, like uh, I discovered Serge Borkiewicz a long yeah. time ago. It was through a recording. Mm -hmm. I think um, Moritz, Moritz Moritz Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Yeah. And I play that one. Is it fifteenth, uh, eighteenth? Yeah, it was over eighteen. D yeah. flat. Yeah, the D flat. Yeah. I learned that one and played that um, from, definitely I remember in my doctorate and thereafter, yeah. and people just went nuts. Oh yeah. Out. It's a great, thunderous, heroic. Oh yeah. Very. Big scale. Yeah. Uh, some mix between Rachmaninoff and List. And yes. Like, it's, big yeah. stuff. And, uh, and I've worked on others. I actually uh, was lucky. I was, I was in Eastern Europe somewhere, yeah. and I found in a bookstore. I don't yeah. think it was a music store. I think it was an yeah. antiquariat, an uh, mm -hmm. antique bookstore kind of yeah. thing. Several volumes of uh, Borkiewicz's music. Ah, and I yeah. bought it all. All of it? I bought it all. Now, oh, as it turns out, if you have access to the IMSLP, yeah. the uh, Petrucci Library, otherwise known, yeah. and you pay like $21 a year for mm -hmm. membership or something, um, it's all there. It's Everything. Only, yeah. I mean, that is one of the greatest resources for yeah. repertoire. Yeah. Pretty much like almost like Chopin, Borkiewicz was almost exclusively all piano. Yeah. Pretty yeah, it's a very interesting life and career and what he did. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, uh, regarding the IMSLP, uh, back, I think it was probably COVID time, mm -hmm. when nobody was going anywhere and had a lot yeah. of time on my hands. I'm happy for me. I, I just was like a monk, and so I just researched. Yeah. Just... Just work. I, I mean, it was fun. I could look at the things yeah. that I was excited about yeah. instead of other things I had to do to make money. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, the money was still kind of coming in, and it was all right. But I got on my IMSLP, and over the course of a few days, I decided I want to make a project out of the nocturne. Wow. And I looked up nocturne as a subject for piano solo. Yeah. There were nearly 600 or maybe more than 600 single compositions available in nocturnes. Wow. I went through every single one of them. I looked at everything. And what I did is I ended up um, printing out, well, I saved a bunch of them, mm -hmm. downloaded them and saved them on my computer. And then I printed up a bunch of them um, and put them in three ring binders. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in one of those concerts, maybe one or two, I don't remember. Uh, but during the COVID year, I did some things called uh, concerts from the Minner Chor. Mm -hmm. Minner Chor is German for the men's chorus. Uh, I'm the director of them, and they were kind enough to keep me on the payroll, even though they couldn't sing for like a year. Yeah, and they kept paying me, which I thought was nice. So I decided to keep the. I referred to as keeping the light of music on in the windows, and so a really not wonderful man. Uh, he's a videographer, he's a professor of it, and does all that stuff. Rudy Lehmann, he helped me with his project, and I did several recordings. And they're really done nicely, I mean, professionally, in terms of the videography and the uh, oral, oh, yeah. oral, the audio stuff, yeah. really good. And I played, um, one concert was just nocturnes. Mm -hmm. And I started out with, like, there's lovely little nocturne of Carl Czerny. Carl Czerny, yeah. Uh, of course, Lesha Titsky, yeah. the Nuage Gris, and Gris, uh, something yeah. else, something Dreams of uh, Franz Liszt. Right. And I played various kinds of things like that into the 20th century. Yeah. Oh, what I got a lot of comments on were five nocturnes of Eric Satie. Satie, yeah. And I had some colleagues and some other pianists write in the comments on these are all available on YouTube. Um, they said, "Wow, these are stunning pieces, really. Yeah, they're they? well crafted. See, this stuff is quote unquote. It's free. Yeah, I you know. know. I M S L P people. I M S L P dot com, yeah. or they also just you do as a search Petrucci P E T R U C C I library, and if you want to, a lot of it you can." Printed out anyway, I think. Yeah. But basically, a membership annually is like I think around twenty-one to twenty-four dollars, something like yeah. that. And it gives you unlimited access. Yeah. And it's incredible how much stuff is loaded up there. Not just piano. Yeah. Chamber music, orchestra scores, opera scores. I mean, everything you can imagine. 
from all over the world. And interestingly, the Russians have uploaded a lot of stuff yeah. from their holdings. Wow. And they have some historically very interesting um, additions of things that were next to impossible to get a hold of. Oh, yeah. There. yeah. And then, of course, the composers that were famous in Eastern Europe and such that we might not have heard of or anything like that. They're there either through Hungarian, Polish, or Russian people who bloated things up. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. Some of the great, greatest piano music comes out of Eastern Europe. So. Yeah. Yeah, Russia had some really great secrets. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, even Anton Rubinstein, you know, he's, we're still discovering stuff from these people. Um, I wanted to tell you, I haven't gotten a chance to tell you, but uh, my old buddies from the Saturday Music Club, I'm not sure if I ever told you about them. They're sort of uh, uh, music, musicians, and I think music did. lovers. in each other's houses? Yeah, we meet in each other's houses, but they had called me up and asked me if I would be available on February 11th to perform. This February? This February wow. 11th. Okay, so now, it's not what you think. It's not going to be a big solo recital. You're not hanging with them lately, though. I haven't been hanging out with them. I haven't actually. I haven't actually performed with them at least about a couple of years. And I'm so oh, sorry right. to say that because my schedule is always... You so know, you can't go. So, but what I can go mean? this time, though. What do they mean? Uh, well, you just have to sort of uh, wait for the email. Is this something you want to put out there to, for at least Columbus people to know well, about? It, it well, I suppose, thing? yeah, I, can, I suppose most people, you know, everybody, it's open to the public, I would imagine. It, but it's a retirement home. Oh, okay. It's at the Kensington, and I've heard of this place, Kensington. Um, it's a retire. I guess it's a retirement place. Um, Where is it? And I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm still Never trying mind. to figure that out. Never mind. Okay. But anyways, they asked you called the what club? It's the Saturday Music Club. Saturday Music Club. Yeah, and Columbus, it, Ohio. Yes, and it's these are pretty much. Some of them are still, you know, they're still. Younger than I am, uh, and others, you know, are retirement age, and you know, we just get together every once in a while during the year and do a recital at somebody's house or at a retirement home. And so, I finally got uh, a date that was uh, free for me as well as them to get together and perform for a while. So, anyways, February eleventh, and the president has asked me. You know, if I could prepare a few pieces, sort of in the Valentine's Day theme. Oh, and so is this a Saturday? Uh, actually, the February eleventh is going to be on a Sunday. Okay, it's a Saturday music club. I still have to find out the history as to why they called it the Saturday music club when they had the recitals on Sunday. But I decided, okay, well, uh, I decided I'm going to do one of my concert arrangements. Cool. Uh, I did a concert arrangement of My Funny Valentine, if you remember. Yep. So I've been trying to relearn this thing. Uh, yes, I'm, I, I've done some dabbling with uh, concert arranging, arranging and some composing as well. You know, I uh, should uh, actually, um, I think we should do this again. What? We tried to send some of your stuff to Stephen Huff. Oh, Stephen Huff, yeah. I'm not sure it got delivered. I might have typed the wrong address, or it wasn't the right one, but is it possible you can find it again? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And let's try to do this again. Okay. Because Elmer actually is a wonderful arranger of uh, just about anything. I mean, he's kind of a jukebox. One of his jobs, he works at this uh, they're from Texas, right? Uh, and Mark, Mark? No, they're from Iowa. Iowa. Mark. Old department store from Iowa. And they have a, there's a, kind of like the Shishi area of shopping in Columbus still, really. It's oh, yeah. Polaris. And it's this big shopping area up over here. There's other ones, nice ones. But this is like the big one. It's just a little bit south of here. Right here. And he plays, um, They. it's one of those kind of department stores. Got the nice stairway or the, Escalators. Escalators that go yeah. upstairs and, and you get hit with all the ladies with the perfumes and everything and you come in one of the doors. Yeah. But he plays uh, piano live 
in this yeah. department store. And there's a, what another five colleagues that do yes, it. Yes, yeah. there's five other pianists at there. Van Moor. And I mean, he's sometimes on for a few hours. Oh yeah, know. about three or four hours. But and he never yeah. listens to note of music. It's no. just all there. Yeah. And he plays, you know, anything that he can play. Sometimes people request that. But he has these wonderful arrangements that he's actually written down. Yeah. I have some of them, he gave it to me. And I was so impressed with them, honestly. I think uh, I'd like to see him publish them, you know, like for real. Yeah. Because I think good. people might like him. And then I know that Stephen Huff, you know, from way back when, oh, he, yeah. he did his own arrangements. He had a thing for doing Broadway stuff. Yeah. Some early back ones, then, you know? Yeah. And, um, I just thought we could send him to him and see if he might be interested in him at all and yeah. if he was kind enough to you know, say something nice about it or even maybe play one or something. Yeah, um, wouldn't hurt. <laughs> it'd, be enough, it'd be sufficient enough to help Elmer get some of this stuff, I think, uh, published. And you know, I was just thinking about this just now. Yeah. We could start a GoFundMe for you to raise enough money to get your music actually professionally typeset and published. Okay. That's you try it. I mean, you can do good. anything with a GoFundMe, right? You yeah. don't even know what that is, do you? I have absolutely no what that is. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it sounded, it sounded kinky at first when yeah. I first what it was, but, but it's... You didn't know. It's just like you have something that you are trying to do, or it's all kinds of things. Sometimes people yeah. try businesses, for-profit, non-profit, they're trying to get things started. Or sometimes it's people been like knocked out by medical bills. Yeah. Or I mean any possible thing and basically you need help. Wow. And okay. it's a way of then applying through the internet right. to strangers for help. Okay. And sometimes there's some amazing stories. Uh, people just, you know, it's like uh, okay, what everything. And I won't say much more beyond this, but okay. I haven't been enough shows up for them to really get the gist of this about me, but I'm a progressive human. I'm a, I don't know, I'm a very spiritual person, all that. Yeah. But I'm a progressive, uh, fundamentally. I think the government and so forth exists for us, it should be for us, you know. And I don't believe that this should be all about handouts and everything, but I don't want to get into that. But the point is, I really supported Bernie Sanders when he was running for president. And his general attitude about things, I like that guy. I like, like him, you know. Kind of independent. He's a thinker about stuff, all that. Anyway, I give $2.70 a month to a, a program called Act Blue, which uh, doesn't support him so much, but the kinds of legislation and things that he's interested in working on. Because at one time, when he was running for president, he just asked people from around the country, uh, he says, I don't want big, massive amounts of money. If everybody can get $27. And he built up a huge war chest for the presidency with $27 contributions from people. Because, I mean, some people can't afford it. But, and then when it went on beyond that, he said, can you afford 270 or $27? Or, you know, I don't know if they do 27 cents, but... I do that 270 thing. And um, GoFundMe is something a bit different than that, but it's the most popular one, I think, in the whole world. And I've seen yeah. some wonderful stories about people who have benefited and had their dreams or their emergencies taken care of and things like that. Just because people have, you know, a few bucks to throw yeah. in until. Yeah. And the important thing about it is it has all of those algorithms which gets the word out you know, yeah. and stuff so people know about it but uh, anyway so you're going to play on february 11th february 11th. sunday at the kensington at what time uh well the recital starts at 6 30 but i can't say for sure if i'm playing right at 6 30. okay um there's like maybe one or two vocalists and there. people can come to this oh well i would imagine it's pretty much open because it's at the retirement it's a retirement Place, yeah. So if you it's want a, to meet, yeah, you know, Elmer in person, maybe get his autograph. <laughs> and the other thing that we don't do in this show, we're not like the two violin guys. Not, yeah. We haven't yet showed them that we could really play the piano. 
Oh, no, we haven't. One of these days. Oh, well, we will. We will. Don't you have anything on video? Anything on video? Me? Yeah, but it's, it's on VHS. Yes. The music <laughs> the music that begins our show is his composition. And he's yeah. Playing that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do have stuff you can look up online. There's a, uh, on YouTube. Yeah. Under Dr. Mark, M A R C Hag, H E E G. Uh, and then also on the Columbus Minicore YouTube page. You can go there and there's various kinds of musical things on there, but there's some different things on there. Oh, by the way, if you ever want to learn a bit more about music, I did a free course on music literacy. Oh, well, yeah. Through, and that's on the Columbus Minicore page. There's, I forget how many lessons. Uh, but lot. I used this wonderful book. Um, it's published by Alfred. Alfred. Yeah. It's basically kind of for adults, so kind adult of theory. Music, music theory. Yeah. And go through it, and people, and I had a number of people. We used to have an internet class where it was like office hours where people mm -hmm. would come in every week yeah. and we'd go over things and they'd ask me questions and stuff. But yeah, there's stuff there if we need to prove ourselves. But yeah. mostly this is born out of us loving to gab about music. Oh, yeah. 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 And I keep interrupting the boy, he's oh. very patient. Oh, and not the invasion <laughs> about. So, but anyway, yeah, during the COVID shutdown, we at least got to meet each other. Yeah. Okay. More formally. Um, boy, that was some time. Anyways, um, so is that all you're going to play? Just your, your arrangement? No. I, Are you going to do some other stuff? I'm hoping I could. How um, much time do they want you to play? Well, according to, according to the president, she says that, uh, since they hadn't seen me in a while, you know, she's pretty much giving me the uh, the, the green beat. light to play whatever oh. I want, as oh. much as I want. So, yeah. pretty much this. I uh, was thinking of doing perhaps the uh, Romance in E-flat, Opus 44 by Anton Rubenstein. Uh -huh. oh, that's a good one. Um, not, not very many people know about this, but that re actually made it to the big band. Uh, hit parade with the uh, the version that Frank Sinatra does. Uh huh. So that's a interesting. One. Some people might know. It. My dad actually knew that. So oh, that's, that's very. Cool. It's in the world's favorite piano music. All those old green and white books. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Rubinstein, that and the Kamenoi Ostro. Kamenoi Ostro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, da da da. That's a good yeah da da da. Which one? The romance. The romance? Oh, yeah. It's the da 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 Oh well, yeah, you could, you could. You know, we could. You know, it might be our one, at least one of many opportunities we could to get it on this. Yeah. You know, so we'll try not to start without you. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I was yeah. thinking of doing that. Maybe some uh, rebel pieces. Ooh. The um, you know the three pieces from 1913. Gaspar. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't even know if I have a stomach for that anymore. <laughs> so, but, um, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm still toying. I'm still playing with it under my head. In my head. Try for you. I was thinking, you know, for just the people over there, maybe as time goes by, you know, I mean, how people got an angry bird. Mm. So, but otherwise, uh, that's pretty much it. That's um, all you got? Well, I don't know. We could talk about, uh, let's see, that you mentioned Hyperion, mm. you know, doing that big piano concerto mm. uh, project. I'd like to give a shout out to Vox. Mm. They had a, they had something going on there for a while that was somewhat similar. It was a piano concerto series. Um, for whatever reason, they stopped at the volume seven mm. and Maybe I should have. I, I did try to hunt for that collection. I know it's up in my archive somewhere, but um, but each volume had something like maybe five or six uh, concerti in it. 
Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. They had a Yawaki Raff in it. Oh, it's not on one album. So it was a multiple album each time? Yeah, there were seven volumes, and there were maybe two CDs, maybe three oh, CDs, CDs in each volume. Oh, CDs. Wow. You know, so they were on CDs. And, uh, like I said, they had people I did had never heard of. There was a Robert Volkmann uh, concerto, uh, Joachim, uh, Raff, Joachim, Joachim, Raff, Raff, yeah. uh, concerto. There was a I mean, just did Alcon. There was an Alcon. Charles Alcon. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, Charles Alcon. Um, and just countless others. I mean, he, uh, mm-hmm. Jerome Rose was one of the pianists, mm-hmm. as was uh, Michael Ponte was on there. Mm-hmm. But many, but, you know, like I said, they, they stopped at volume seven. Mm-hmm. Now, these things I just collected over the years. So, I don't know. Do you think and they were a fair? They were a decent price too. I don't think any any one of them cost more than ten bucks. Wow. And the yeah. The we, we we did last week. We were talking about you know the changes in the recording industry. Yeah. Um, I would say it seems to me we have quite a few young artists which are you know being marketed and getting yeah. attention. Yeah. The world, there's recordings always coming out. My God, at least in terms of news I get, there's always, probably thanks to the twin violinist to Roy Chen, a lot of violinists. Oh, Ray Chen. Come yes. Ray Chen coming out and, you know, their recordings and such. And I love the, um, I think he's German, Hockerich, or um, I can't think it was exactly the name, but wonderful violinist I've heard lately. Uh, not too old still, he's kind of a youngish guy. I find. But um, I was just thinking when he's talking about this, you know, I think it had to do after the Second World War, the United States was extraordinarily wealthy because mm-hmm. we were basically the only place left on the planet that hadn't been pretty much mm-hmm. brought to ruins. I mean, we had Pearl Harbor in Hawaii to deal yeah. with, but and but otherwise we were made untouched, and then our industries were available to help rebuild the world. So I think everybody knows. I mean, fifties and the sixties, America was doing really well uh, because we were helping to rebuild the world. Yes. Now I know people have different opinions about that, but nonetheless, the financial reality, and I think also due to the Cold War. Um, it helped a lot that Ben Clyburn won the Tchaikovsky. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of money. Wow. Oh, yeah. Lots of money poured into the classical music industry. And there, and I also think especially in Europe, as they were rebuilding Europe, and I think probably it might have been a morale thing mm-hmm. to get Europeans proud and happy again to, you know, to be thinking about who they were and their traditions and their contributions and all that. And there are just so many, especially coming out of Europe, recordings like these concerto recordings and various things. Uh, Or some of these orchestras, for example, from Czechoslovakia, the Czech Philharmonic a lot, even in the communist days, we're doing a lot of recording. I mean, like, in some cases, I don't know how they worked it out, but it costs a lot less money for the Czech orchestra to make recordings uh, than it did for a German orchestra, certainly a British orchestra. Oh, yeah. God forbid an American orchestra. Mm-hmm. Um, it was cheaper. Huh. You know? And there's a lot of things from the early from the LP time when then was a Camelot. Yeah. These as they started to come over, you know, these European ensembles and artists, which some of which were actually behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah. You know, there were some kinds of cultural inter- intersections like that. And I know now, I mean of course there's wonderfully trained musicians, but especially now since the fall of communism, um, Czechoslovakia actually is a very popular place to go. For scenery, for filmmaking, yeah. Was that 
more than one Philippal Giamatti did, where they were based oh, in Giamatti, yeah, in Giamatti, yeah. based in the Ch in Czechia. It's not Czechoslovakia. It's the Czech Republic. Yeah, Czech Republic. Yeah. And then the orchestras in the Czech Republic yeah. are often making. Um, they do the film music recordings yeah. as full orchestra because they cost less money than London, for example. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I was thinking about this also recently when I traveled the world. Very clearly, in the Middle Ages in Europe, there seems to have been, relatively speaking, a lot of financial progress. Then, if not the Middle Ages, but certainly into the Renaissance, yeah. because um, so many cities all over Europe, in the Mediterranean places, um, there are are in the older parts of the cities extant medieval Renaissance architecture. Yeah. And then like here in the United States, we're a younger country. But if you look at um, cities from the later 19th century, when the industrial period had really taken off big time, it was, we really started to get some big industry stuff going. Um, in my hometown, from 18... 80s perhaps through 1900 into the 20s there's a lot of houses <laughs> a lot of houses yeah. still standing up that they're from that period of time especially if they belong to wealthier people they're in really good condition they're still there and then it seemed like after the second world war there in Springfield, there's a growth, maybe in the late '50s and the '60s, of the kind of smaller yeah. homes, and they just grew like mushrooms all over the place. And then I think again in Springfield, the next time when it really popped up was in the '90s, because that's when everybody was playing the market, and there was a tremendous amount of money uh -huh. running around in the '90s, and there was a lot of development again in Springfield, an area which in fact has taken over Ridgewood, which is where we had been living as like the place to be. Yeah. And you can see some of these gargantuan California kind of style yeah. architectural creations. But it, what my point is, is that it's just interesting that there are some periods of time where there's just, there's more money clearly in the community, in the, in the society. Yeah. And sometimes you see things that were able to be done, which can't be done. For example, it amazes me if Hyperion is so actively, mm -hmm. they're actively recording these piano concertos. Yeah. But that's British, right? Yeah, it is British. Never happened in the United States. <laughs> we wouldn't do it. No. Because there's not enough market for it. No, there isn't. This is purely uh, uh, an archaeological and historical testament just to make this music sonorously available so people yeah. can hear it. Um, I'm working for this opera company here in Columbus called Opera Project, and we're going to resurrect an opera by uh, Shirley Du Bois, who was the wife of William Du Bois, who was the founder of the NAACP. Shirley was a graduate, master's student at Oberlin College here in Ohio. Yeah. And she very clearly had mastered her craft. She'd already been active as a musician and had studied with Boulanger at Paris. I don't know if it was after this or before, but she was an active composer and musician, actually pretty good. I don't know what instrument she might play, probably not certainly piano, but yeah. at least had some skills. She it. wrote this opera called Tom Tom in the 1930s when she was at Oberlin. It ultimately succeeded in getting a full uh, two performances in Cleveland in the early 50s uh, with a black opera company and lots of black people showed up and it was given in a stadium because there were so many people that came and saw it. The problem that we've had is we did manage to find, I did some research I found through the Harvard libraries and stuff, her papers, manuscripts and all that. And then another person, which I hadn't found at first, we actually found 
a uh, handwritten manuscript of uh, the score, the conductor's score, more or less um, written out, but not thoroughly voiced yeah. out into everything. It's mostly kind of in a sense piano centric, but she does notate a lot what it's yeah. usually do, why. Um, but we are about to embark. I've got a couple um, computer geeky people who okay. work with uh, Finale and some other music score, yeah, something like that. Yeah. They're going to create a conductor score uh, for us that's completely notated with all the instruments. I'm going to advise them about that. They have to do a little editorial guesswork sometimes yeah. and make some choices which may or may not have been Shirley's because there's no clear way to know in some cases, but good, good guessing. Yeah. And then we're going to have, we'll, we'll pull all the orchestra parts out from that. And then there's another fellow that we know uh, in New York who's actually done some work with this show, wrote his own um, piano productions out for some, yeah. some of the music. Let's see if he can create a piano vocal score. And then we have to get that out to the singers that we hire to do the opera. Everything, but the problem that we have, nobody knows the work. Yeah, there is no music until we create it. I mean, the, the, the printed scores, yeah. and there are no recordings. Uh, people often use recordings to reference. To yeah, them, you know, or they know the works well. It's the marriage of figures. Yeah. Who doesn't know the famous artist from that? Yeah. It's so much in our ears and our blood and our culture. But this is interesting because until we create this, nobody has heard this music or even actually really seen it since the 1950s. It's been 70 some years. Well, in the cases of these concerti yeah. that have been written, uh, there was one, it was by the Dutch guy. I think that's the one I said to you. He was, no, he was German, but his father was Dutch, and he had a Dutchish yeah. career. Um, he was a pianist and very active. He wrote something like seven piano concertos, well, 25 symphonies and all this yeah. kind of stuff. I listened to one, the third in D minor, which is, eh, and he even, <laughs> he even thought it was in eh, himself. But then I listened to the seventh, and it was really quite good. And it's an opportunity just to simply... It's a luxury yeah. for us to be able to have access to these kinds of things, which otherwise would have been absolutely completely Possibly, forgotten. Yeah. And if they're not dug up and restored now, and especially with the contemporary technology yeah. we have, they could end up <clears throat> totally yeah. forgotten. Yeah. Totally gone, because if the stuff's only on paper, I thought I saw an interesting article yeah. about this. The problem with some of the old cultures like uh, Egypt and some other ones is that they kept their records on papyrus. Yeah. Or so, like the Alexandria Library, so much was written on scrolls. And when the Assyrians came in, they burned it. Yeah. One of the great losses to humanity. Uh, God only knows what was on those rolls, yeah. you know. But what they did say, which was very interesting about the Mesopotamians, the predecessors to the Iraqis, right. yeah. and so yeah. forth. They were on clay tablets. They would write the stuff down and then bake it so that it was permanent. And as it got older, it was pretty hard stuff. Yeah. And it's amazing. There's they say that there's perhaps two hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand of these clay tablets in libraries yeah. in the world. A lot of them in London. But I don't even think twenty percent of them. Translated. Probably, but not. the cool You're thing talking is, the, is that yeah. they found them. You know, Doug Oh, here's another one. Yeah, <laughs> no. and uh, it, they can be anything. Sometimes they're bank records or uh, tax records or a decree from the government or, uh, if what's really interesting, spiritual declarations mm -hmm. or you know, things, various kind of things. That's how they communicated information with these things. And it lasted. And I think what's good is that we'll keep 
paper copies of things, and papers, new paper is more durable than old paper. Yeah. But then we have digital copies of things. One way or another, that stuff can be stored. Um, and then the important thing is we also have the acoustic recordings. We have the music alive on recordings, yeah. which also can be digitally saved, as well as hard copies of things. It's not the same thing as bricks, but... Otherwise, I think it's amazing because this stuff would just yes, it would disappear. disappear. Absolutely, you know. So yeah, I'm always worried about uh, uh, using even computers. Uh, <laughs> well, the thing I've been following more on the news lately is I prefer I prefer pencil and paper. Yeah, folks. <laughs> yeah, the old way. <laughs> so, yeah, I still tend to rely on those things a lot, but yeah. because because. Well, I'm reading a book right now. Uh, I'll have to look at the title. I'll think about this. But the author is Robert Schock, S-C-H-O-C-H. He was probably most famous internationally for his work with John Anthony West back in the 90s, maybe. Uh, he's a full professor of um, geography. Huh. rocks and strata yeah. and things like yeah. that at Boston University. And he became interested in ancient Egypt and especially the Sphinx. Yeah. And he wrote some interesting papers and eventually a book about it where he pretty much, and then he's still battling with Egyptologists. Yeah. A lot of people think that contemporary Egyptology is a bunch of lies and it's biased towards inaccurate ways of looking at things going back into the 19th century, which were very culturally biased. But basically what Robert Schock said about the Sphinx is it very clearly based upon the way that the rocks look yeah. and the quarry that it was cut out of. Because the stones where it is from, yeah. it's actually not cut and moved like the pyramids. Yeah. It's actually cut out of this rocky area. Huh. And the quarry is all around it. And what he's, one of his specialties is, is looking at uh, knowing how to age rocks and strata, all different kinds of minerals and things, and how it's aged by rainwater. Oh. And he's determined that the erosion on the Sphinx has nothing to do with it being sandblasted or anything like that. Because one of the things he says anyway, is clearly going back into ancient times, only maybe the head was available open sometimes and it was covered by sand and then the sand is protecting it but he said the erosion is very clearly on the sphinx and on the rocks around it is due to erosion from continual um, seasonal rain and the last time that it rained or was raining sufficiently yeah. for that kind of degradation to have happen over centuries or maybe a couple thousand years or something yeah. like that was as far back as 8,500 BC, which precedes wow. kind of Egyptology by saying, you know, the oldest dynasties show up around 4,000 something. Huh. And they say that Khufu maybe rebuilt the Giza pyramid in 2,600 or something. Of course, John Anthony West says, no, these things go way back, longer back, 13,000 years or something like that. And blah, 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 blah. Anyway, Robert Schock wrote this. Um, stuff and you know he's a scientist and when he just says you can argue about opinions or about guesses but when it comes down to pure scientific knowledge yeah. of knowing how continual rain erodes various rock strata yeah we all know that that's part of our training as geologists no not geography geology, geology. that's a special and I think it's really changed a lot of people's minds. Everybody's kind of, you know, okay. And he's <laughs> continued to go, and as he has gone on in time, he's continued to push the date farther back for other reasons. So he's at least backwards towards 10,000 or even 12,000 BC. But this other book that he's written, he's looking at some uh, places that he studied where he believes that there was a great uh, conflagration on the planet. There's evidence of it in Turkey and on the island where the big heads are in uh, 
Oh, Easter, Easter Island. Island. Yeah. yeah. And I just finished struggling through a chapter, which is really scientific. You know, so but he's basically looking at the effect of the sun and its cycles yeah. on life and on the weather and on everything, existence on this planet. Yeah. And what he's obviously getting to it's a really cool book i'll find the title and i'll let you know the next time um but he's been at this point in the books showing quite clearly that the sunspot activity on the sun we have not seen that kind of activity since the period between the younger and the older dryas which is between nine and twelve thousand bc we're due for some serious <laughs> crap. <laughs> and one of the things that we're also already seeing news about sometimes is how the sunspot activity sends plasma out into the to us and then of course it comes to us, you know, and we're protected by the electromagnetic field stuff, but it still affects it. Yeah. Because the, 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 the plasma charges the field and stuff. And then there are things out in space circling us. So what's very interesting is that a lot of these, uh, what do you call it, the things that are flying around the planet all the time, the conducting energy, uh, messages, uh, satellites. Okay. The sun may take a number of those out. Oh. And has been, apparently. Yeah. And uh, they're expecting very possibly a pretty sizable even like earlier this month, week, yeah. uh, what do they call it? Electro EMP, electromagnetic yeah. pulse. Yeah, it's gonna knock out. You know, knock out the internet. Yeah, you got cell exactly. phones and all everything. That. Yeah, absolutely. And we have noticed occasionally here and there by watching the news that um, sometimes the signal just isn't there. You know? Yeah, it just it's gone. Well, if, if you ever if they if that time ever comes. The safest place for your uh, batteries would be your microwave. Inside it? Yeah, stick some batteries in there. You want to save your batteries, stick them in there. I didn't know that. Yeah, because nothing comes out, nothing goes in. Cool. All right, that's good to know. Yeah, so. I have to explain to Robin why we're keeping our batteries inside. <laughs> or explain to Laura why we're yeah. keeping the batteries inside. So right. whenever that time comes. But I'm grateful. Uh, I mean, I do have. Actually, re re resubscribed to Kindle Unlimited, so I bought a digital books in my library and have access to what is a million and a half titles of this. But I'm very grateful for my hard copies. Oh yeah, do, and also for my. I, I'm hoping that there's still electricity of some sort. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll have to use candles. For my LPs. Oh, that <laughs> and record player. Otherwise, you, you might just have to rely on the piano, you know, an acoustic piano to play all our music. And mine's additional grand hybrid. Yeah. So <laughs> we have to get one of those bicycles, you know, where if you ride it, you charge, you don't get electricity. Right? Yeah. Laura, I want to play the piano for a while. I'll jump on that bike and run. For <laughs> <laughs> she do it too. She's a she's a yeah. exercise freak. <laughs> yeah. Well, can I show my recordings? Yeah, sure, show the recordings. Some more show tell. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to do a shout out about yeah. uh, Marston again as well. But oh, now, yeah. last week I shared with you. Yeah. This is called. This is from Sony Records. These are uh, discovered treasures. Yeah. Of Vladimir Horowitz's yes, recordings. Yes, he did share with us. Right? And the um, there. Are other versions of the, many of the same pieces, yes. which is recorded. Before. Yeah, a particular interest here. He performs book one of number fourteen from the Gratis Ad Parnassum by Clementi. Yeah, yeah. That must be from the fifties. Yeah. Or sometime there. Recorded nineteen seventy-two. Oh, much later. Yeah, so. Because yeah. I have um, an LP that he made, which is from. I think it was the fifties. It was when he was retired. Yeah. Nineteen fifty-three to nineteen sixty-five. Yeah. yeah. He left the stage. Yeah. And uh, he was still doing studio recordings. There's a famous eighth and ninth yeah. sonatas of Scriabin. Scriabin. Yeah, yeah. Holy God. 
It's yeah. like the piano's on fire. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely. really scary stuff. Uh, but then it's also when he began to get into uh, Clementi. Yeah. Clementi and Scarlatti. And Scarlatti. And the Scarlatti that recording. Was yeah. No. Oh, look at this. Metner. He records Metner. The fairy tale. The fairy tale in A major, opus 51, number three. It sounds like a sleigh ride. It's, uh -huh. It definitely sounds rather Well, fun. I'll let you show them all, all right. at the same time. But okay. Then I, I got this oh, one on this Thursday. Is this is nice. Oh, this is a bunch of short Tchaikovsky. Oh, look at this. I'll bring this one up. Check it out. From Ivory Classics. Uh, recording label that was started by Earl Wilde. Tchaikovsky was a student of Joseph Hoffman because uh, he came over from Europe. He's from Odessa. Yep. And was really an extraordinary child prodigy, really. Absolutely. Trained in Germany to some extent and performed there. And then because he's a Jew... Yeah. various things like that but even before all that stuff happened yeah. he came over to the states and he was in baltimore interestingly and appealed to some people there they, they did a concert and marketed it quite big and then i don't know if it was in baltimore or philadelphia perhaps or even in new york he also performed in new york he's only like 14 years old yeah. it was very interesting because some of the big pianos went to see friedman um Rachmaninoff, uh, Zabowski, probably. Uh, heard him play, yeah. and they all said, we got to get him situated at Curtis. Yeah. So he was put at the Curtis Institute, and he studied with Joseph Hall. Yeah. So some of you guys have seen him uh, in his last years, when he was uh, tiny, a little portly, not yeah. really, but, but if, I mean, he always dressed really very dapperly. Yeah, and he was married, but I always thought he was probably gay. But and that's not necessarily not true yeah. for guys from that generation. But and my apologies if anyone's offended by that. But um, wow, look at that! He lived in London ultimately, and he disappeared from America after the war and stuff. And I think he went back to Europe, and I think we lost touch with him for oh yeah, we did for decades for a while. And, but he based himself in, in uh, London. And then he started to come up again. I have a whole bunch of his CDs because I got so excited about him yeah. when I heard him because it's amazing play. This is old school, extraordinary. Oh, yeah, awesome. he's absolutely But uh, Nimbus Records, I don't know if they're still making records, but the Nimbus Records from England had bought a uh, palace of some sort out in the countryside for somebody. Really nice space. Put a beautiful piano in there and had very limited filtering kind of contemporary mm -hmm. recording equipment. Um, and their policy was to try to find artists who would try to do recordings as live as possible, mm -hmm. meaning with as yeah. minimal amount of editing and filtering and all that yeah. stuff. And that. Um, they found an ideal person with Tchaikovsky because the guy was able to come in and play some of this devilishly difficult mm -hmm. stuff and no perfect, you know, maybe do a second take. I don't know if he ever even did a third take. Uh, and it was just, yep, that's a cut. Do it. It reminds yeah. me of recording when those few things that uh, Chopin recordings, so the etudes and things yeah. that Beno Moisevich did, did in London. Yeah. Came in with his bowler hat and his coat. It was winter outside and his cigar. And he came in, put the cigar down, put his hat down, sat down, warmed up the little piano. And he said, Are you ready, Maestro? Yeah. Okay. And he cut within two days' time. So many sides of 78s, but they yep. ended up on one or two CDs. Yeah. These recordings. And a lot of it was like Chopin etudes and yep. some smaller works and stuff like that. They gave you $5,000 the first day, for, or pounds, I think. Yeah. 5,000 pounds a nice day. And the most time he ever spent was an hour and a half each day. <laughs> <laughs> 5,000, even in this day, 5,000 yeah. pounds for an hour and a half of work. You know, can you imagine what that bought back in those days? Yeah, I know. Holy God. Well, Tchaikovsky was like this with Nimbus uh, Records. And um, 
There's some wonderful things if you can find them. That I'm sure are probably still available used here and there. I've taken apart your CD. That's okay. But this is, uh, is this Fox? No, who'd you say? This is Ivory. Ivory Classics. Ivory. And these are particularly some of the early recordings from the 40s uh, that he did. Um, had been in his 30s at that time. Oh, yeah. And I think these were all done here in the States before he went back to Europe. Yes, my earliest uh, recollections of listening to Sherkowski was back in 1980-81. And the first time I heard of him was on a radio program called, let me see. Uh, oh, gosh, help me out. It was, a pro, it was a piano program on Sundays. And Paul Hume was the host of the oh. show. And it was a piano program oh. on Sundays at sun on Sundays at five o'clock. o'clock. Paul Hume. In club? Uh, well, I heard it up in Finley, Finley? Ohio. No, I, I heard it up in Finley, Ohio, and I, I think it was from I think it was um, broadcasted oh, from Toledo, oh, from oh, from Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. Yeah, no, we didn't, you, we didn't get stuff from Toledo. But, but um, Toledo's got good classical music. But it was excellent because on that program I got to hear Tchaikovsky play. Let's see. Uh, fantasy, well, the Mendelssohn's F sharp minor fantasy. Really? He also did Wine Women's Song by Strauss, Godowski arrangement. Yeah. He also did, gosh, some other stuff out there. Uh, I think it was, I think it was uh, Norman Reagan and the Unsa Spiro had a list. Norman Reagan, yeah. Yeah. And something else, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. It was the uh, it was this uh, boogie woogie etude by uh, oh, yeah. Gould Morton yeah, Gould by Gould. the way yes he also has here I guess he had a thing for Morton Gould here he's yeah, got a few two works here by Morton Gould the uh, Prelude and Toccata and the boogie woogie etude I'm not sure but I think there's a book that I have of American music and I don't I think it's is it the Dover edition. Where it goes into the 20th century. Yeah. And there's some Morton Gould in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tchaikovsky, actually, one of the times, earlier times, I heard him play. And I think, I, I, I don't know, do I own this? Or did you, what is it, loan it to me? Or are you giving me a copy of The Golden Age of the Piano, hosted by Ben oh, Clyburn? Yeah. This is interesting. Ben Clyburn hosts it, but basically there's all these... Uh, various older generation pianists who are playing. Some of them are captured particularly for the program, and some of them are from older uh, video films uh, where they have to play. And one of them is Tchaikovsky, and he comes out and he plays. And one of the pieces he plays is either the, I think it's the Kaleidoscope. Oh, yeah, the Hoffman Scott Kaleidoscope, yeah. yeah. He plays some of his teacher's original compositions. Yeah. Kaleidoscope in the Sanctuary. Yeah. Those, if you've ever looked at those, are, I mean, you know, somebody could play them, I think she, she could figure them out and work them out with the Yuja Wang. Yuja Wang. She's yeah. got that kind of gift. Yeah. She could, I mean, this, uh, I, I've got the music and I've thought about trying to learn them, at least for my own pleasure. I don't know if I'd ever play them for anybody, but oh, it's, gosh. it's difficult because it's like, like with the kaleidoscope, the problem is, is just the notes are all over the place. Yeah. But it's like when you turn the kaleidoscope, you know, it's the same pieces of glass, but they move. Yeah. Well, every time you come sweeping down through an arpeggio, the notes are different. Yeah. One after the other. And it's it's not, it's just gossamer. Yeah. It's like wings on a dragonfly and how fast they move. That's how many notes are moving and stuff. Take something like a genius like Hoffman or Tchaikovsky. Ch 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 <laughs> maybe yeah. Joe Wayne could do it. Yeah. I got a couple others I want to share. Well, this guy does everything. Look at this. Does everything. You have your sass. I mean, every na nationality is is represented on. Oh, look at this. Glinka. Mikhail Glinka. Yeah. The father of a Russian opera even has a piece in here. He's represented playing the Tarantella in A minor. Wow. Boy, who's going to even even give 
what cast is even going to give Glinka a look? You know, this is why I like to get yeah. and look at things like this because yeah, it's wonderful. Music repertoire kind of comes in and out. I recently accompanied a very gifted a young Chinese pianist, uh, seventeen years old. She played the first movement of the Greek piano concerto uh, this past weekend at Graves. There's a competition every year to play for a young artist to play with the New Albany Symphony, and. Um, I was really struck by this young woman. She had very specific things that she wanted me to do with the orchestra part, uh, how to play it. And she, she brought such a Yun Chan Lin kind of <laughs> delicacy and ear yeah. and finesse to it. Um, played on the softer side of things, like, you know, in the cadenza, when yeah. you have, uh, after the first part, when it's a dum, dum, da 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 you know, this yeah. huge arpeggio with yeah. the right hands. I never really paid attention to it for a long time, but most of that on that page is pianissimo. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> she did, she she did she do it pianissimo? pianissimo? Wow. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, some people, like, I, I heard yeah. a recording recently, uh, just a little bit, some lady, young uh, lady playing the Greek, and... Bum, ba ba 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 That's enough. I hit the X and turned it off. Because I just, oh God, this is going to be a big masturbatory fantasy on ego. Yeah. And uh, actually, I thought it was telling that when I said, well, what about your tempi and your robot or things that you're going to do? And she said, well, I think probably the best reference recording, the one I like a lot, is Zimmerman. Zimmerman, yeah. Christian Zimmerman. Yeah. And I listened to the first movement with him. He's probably uh, 18, something like that, when he recorded it with uh, Foncario. Uh -huh. I'm a great fan of Zimmerman. Did he have his beard? Uh, when was young, yeah, just a little one like that. Okay, so it would have been a little later than yeah. that. So. Well, no, maybe he does it on the because it was a picture from the side. I don't think he had a beard yet. Okay. Um, Zimmerman is always just, he's a prince. I mean, in terms of piano playing. I, I mean, one of the great show things, I think, is years after he was done in America, mostly Bernstein's, conducting the Vienna Philharmonic with um, Zimmerman. Playing the Brahms first in the first half, and then he comes out in the second half and plays Brahms second. Yeah. That was the concert, and it was recorded. Yeah. Live. Live. <laughs> Live. And it's faultless playing. It's yeah. not only faultless, but it's some of the most sensitive handling of the Brahms concerti I've ever heard. I mean, it's powerful, but it needs to be. Yeah. But it's not banging. Right. Exactly. And there are voices coming through and uh -huh. character colors and things that I'm not used to hearing, especially Brahms D minor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can crash away some of the chords in the B flat, but there are times when the D minor really seems it has a possibility for you to crash your way. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. It doesn't happen. Well, this young lady kind of played like that, and I was really quite pleased with her performance. I hope she does well. You know, I, there's another kid in there that played the Sanson G minor in the first solo oh, right? But he heard through the door and it was tremendous. Good for them. Well, I'm probably going to do some things. But no, it's just that I remember growing up, I mean, uh, Ben Glover recorded the Greek. Oh yeah, he did. And back in when I was a kid, it was kind of a big concerto. Oh yeah. But I would say it was a very popular concerto back After then. the 90s, yeah. the two, yeah. or the 2000s, for about 10 years. Ago. Yeah. Leonard Pinario. 20 Pinario. years, it just kind of disappeared. Leonard Pinario. Yeah. Yeah, Leonard Pinario made his debut with that concerto. I have been he playing the second and third rock. 13 Wonderful. years old. And he had to learn that thing in a week. <laughs> learn it in a week. And you're not talking just first movements either. He did the yeah. whole thing at 13. So I've got uh, some others I wanted to show you. This was an interesting one. This Which is one? Um, uh, the Tchaikovsky first. 
Okay. And with Brent Argerich, the Symphony Orchestra, this by actually the one folks, uh, very, very oh. good. But look who the conductor is. I thought this who was is very the interesting. Conductor? All right, the conductor. Whoa! Whoa! That's the conductor he... who loved working with Van Cliburn. Yeah! Kirill Kondrashin. And this was the latter part oh, of his life, and this looks like about the age she was in the period of time. Yeah, look at when this. When we heard her play in the early 80s uh, in Carnegie Hall with the Boston Phillips Symphony recording in um, St. John's Island. Yeah. I haven't had time to listen to it yet, but I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And there is a box set of some of her stuff available. They're starting to really, because she's, can you believe this now? Yeah. She's like 83 years old now. Yeah. And still... still play oh, yeah. magnificently. Yeah. So, I saw her very interesting. She was yeah. playing the Tchaikovsky yeah. with Charles Dutrois yeah. and her Verbier Orchestra. Oh, baby. But what was interesting to me, I saw her look over a couple of times at him because he was looking at her, mm -hmm. or even sometimes on the piano. He was taking a little too much time, you know, kind of being largesse and big with it, and she wanted to move. And there's a couple of times when she did just like, she was just... <laughs> Let's, let's go, let's move. Yeah. Now, supposedly, her uh, her latest recording in the studio is supposed to be the uh, WC Fantasy. For really? Yeah. Well, I, I know that heard. because of that tape collection of, of uh, yeah. French piano concertos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. she's supposed to record that. Cool. And so um, I'm still waiting to hear any word as to whether it's... I, they've I, done it yet? They've, or? Got, they've got some good competitive prices on one of the big... Sony boxes of yeah. a lot of her earlier recordings. Oh God, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine the woman has had that long of a career. Oh, you know what recording I want to find? Supposedly, she had recorded the uh, the ten pieces from uh, Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. Ooh, I want to get a hold of that. One. Wow. You know, because rumor has it, you know, I'm hearing voices here from uh, left and right from some of my colleagues saying that it's absolutely impeccable. Is this something that you? Loan to me that I watched or did I see it on YouTube? What is it? Well, there's an interesting video of her and Nelson Freer. Ah, yeah. I because of the video, I actually got some of his stuff. He's an amazing man. Oh, he is. He's I dead know. a long time ago, yeah. but what a wonderful colleague. And I don't know if they were friends, more than friends. I think they might have been lovers at some time. They, but the video is really cool because when it was made, it's made in. Um, it's in Spanish and then mm -hmm. Argentina recorded yeah. in the home they yeah. shared together many many years back and it's mostly uh, them kind of an intimate portrait yeah. based around music and piano playing talking about music and stuff and a very easygoing relationship very kind um, supportive somewhat humorous different pianists, but the, the, the thing was, she spoke so highly of him. Oh, yeah. And I heard some of his playing in the video. I actually bought uh, some recordings. I have a, one where it's a weird combination, but it's Leon Fleischer on part of the CD, and the other is Nelson Fair. Yeah. Yeah. There's some others. But, no, I mean, she goes back to, like, uh, the times when Baron Boyd was playing with the, uh, what was that, Ensemble... Where he was with uh, Jacqueline Dupre and oh, Zubin May to play the bass, place. and they did the trout. The trout, yeah. The trout. yeah. Did they have a name for themselves? Or I don't know if they had a name, but I remember seeing video footage of that. And was it Violet Stein? Was the violinist maybe from the Cleveland Quartet eventually? Yeah. But Zubin May is playing string bass. Yeah. This is a very interesting and very good performance of Franz Schubert's Trout oh, Quintet. Yeah. yeah. Jacqueline Dupre, who eventually died from Moscow and dystrophy of yeah. sclerosis. I think, I don't know. So which one one of the it was something like that. She was married to Baron Boyle at the time. He's a pianist. Yeah. And this amazing, made this playing the bass. You know, he was a string bass player. Yeah. Quite a good one. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't remember the other. I used to get a big kick out of this conducting. I was wondering if it was Peter Weilerstein. This is that kind of thing you guys could fill in in, yeah. the, in the commentary. Uh, who played the violin. He, Viol Violerstein used to be, I believe, the principal violinist of the Cleveland Quartet, eventually. Because he's kind of one of his kids 
is now a very big uh, street player with his own career. Is it Joshua Violet Johnson? No, I don't think he's violinist. I think he might be the old. But then I got this. Yes. This is another lady that I'm very interested in because she's a... Um, what's the word? Uh, she cites herself as this. Uh, yeah. On, what do they call them? They're in the spectrum. They're uh, Asperger's. Asperger's syndrome yeah. kind of thing or something All like right. that. It's not the extreme version. What, what, what did Rain Man have? He was... He was autistic. He was autistic. Yeah, he was autistic. So... Now they have that expression, they call it the spectrum. They're in yeah. the spectrum, which in the most extreme part of it is apparently autism. Yeah. But then this Asperger's syndrome, it also affects a lot of folks in different ways. But anyway, yeah. she, um, she says that she was diagnosed this way. She's brilliant, um, aloof, yeah. a very odd student at the time. But uh, her lifestyle is different. But uh, and uh, the thing that she's done too is, you know, she has this international wolf. Yeah. Uh, save the wolves or yeah. rescue kind of yeah. thing. In upstate New York, she has a huge place. She goes out and hangs around with these wolves. Yeah, stuff. she has. She lives with them. Yeah, she lives. With them. We're talking about Ellen Grimaud. Ellen Grimaud. And this is the Va is a brilliant, brilliant classic. I think. Oh yeah, here it is. These are her early recordings. You can see on the back, uh, if this is big enough that you can. Oh, yeah. See on it. the camera. Yeah, I think they could. No, the other side. The other side? Yeah. The contents, folks. Yeah. You can contents. See that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's got some good things on oh, yeah. it. I have I, brilliant classics. I don't have uh, any of her recordings before now, oh, I think. Yeah. Well, but I've heard her many times in YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh, very interesting Brahms, D minor. Oh, yeah. Um, the Mozart she did with a chamber group in, was it in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have, to my ear, I wouldn't listen to her for a luxurious, beautiful tone. Not like Yu Chung Lim. Yeah. Or, or even like uh, Ignaz Friedman, that kind of mm -hmm. wonderful lightness and delicacy of playing. But she certainly has really interesting ideas. Oh, yeah. And what I like about her, well, I think I mentioned this last week. Um, she reminds me of um, Nadia Salerno Sonnenberg on the violin. She seems to have kind of disappeared. Yeah. But uh, years ago, she had her time to comment through the sky. Oh, yeah. She's quite a unique musician. Nadia? Nadia, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember, I think I talked about it last time. Um, my ex-wife and I we were in a car in the winter, and we were hearing this incredible performance of the Mendelssohn E minor. Mm -hmm. Really nice, yeah, good, playful. You know, the last movement. We did leave the heat on, but we sat out in the driveway and listened to the entire thing so we could find out who the violinist was. And it was her in twenty-five below weather outside. Yeah. She strikes me. There's something about her music making which is quite unique and different. Now I'm going to upset somebody by saying this. There's also another pianist who's quite regarded as having some oddities, by Fazıl Say. Mm, when I yeah. was living and working in the Turkish sphere in the Mediterranean, that's all I ever heard about Fazıl Say. This Fazıl Say that. And you know they're proud. They have a right to be proud of certain folks. There. Who's the uh, the pianist we've talked about in the past? Who, from from Turkey. From Turkey. Who studied with uh, Corto. She's old. Oh, Edel Barre. Edel Barre. Yeah. Yeah. She's. Yeah. She's phenomenal. I've heard amazing. I heard yeah. a live performance of her. She played etudes of Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and I think Ligeti. Yeah. In complete one recordings of Rachmaninoff. When I say complete, I mean all of it. That's amazing. She's done. She did both versions of the Rachmaninoff Sonata Number no. Two, yeah. 1913 and the 1931. But even did, even recorded the uh, Rachmaninoff cadenza to Franz Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody Number no. Two. <laughs> <laughs> the cadenza. You know? This is really an amazing. And she found everything. No. She did. She does excerpts from the uh, opera, one act opera, Aleko. Fazal Say, on the other hand, 
You guys may write in what you have to say. He lives outside of Turkey. He's quite uh, outspoken about political things. This is in Switzerland, I think, is where his home is. Um, he was uh, apparently recently performed in Carnegie Hall, I think it was. I think he played the Hammer Club here, maybe. Um, wow, I didn't take it for that. I saw some stuff about a review, and it didn't surprise me, because uh, some people were quite warm to him, and then other people was like, huh? <laughs> um, He's also a pretty active composer and performs his own music. Yeah, he does. I think he's done even film music as well that's been done. Um, so I'm not going to say any more than that because we're not in here to, to trash people. Uh, I could say I could say that he's probably not one of my favorite pianists. Yeah. But um, he's certainly unique. Yeah. But his uniqueness tends to go in... I mean, rubato is one thing, and I, I, I'm a great believer in myself. I love the playing of the old guys from the 19th century. I mean, Friedman, I've learned, oh, yeah. is just absolutely treasure, and that's very unique stuff. But in my mind still, it's rubato that makes sense gesturally and or structurally. Yeah. Chopin was famous for saying, if you steal it, you have to put it back somewhere yeah. else, you know? Um, yeah, a size or body don't work that way, in my mind. Okay. And, you know, I know there's people, not just Turkish people, but people who are really nuts about the board. So, uh, I don't, I uh, apologize, I did, but we all have our opinions, right? So, yeah. but you want to say anything more about her? Oh, well, I have, I have one of her books. She came really? out with a book. Yeah. She's written at least three now. I didn't know that, but I have one of the one of her books, the one that's got the picture of her with her wolves, oh, and basically she's uh, uh, it's about how she was raised, you know, with her family and her how she developed as a musician as a person, yeah. and it's odd. She doesn't mention names, but instead, uh, the people, her friends, relatives are represented by a certain trait about their personality. Uh, that's interesting. And that's how they were represented. She'll name her father, she'll name her grandfather uh, compulsive. Yeah. And so he doesn't, she doesn't call him, him or address him as grandfather in her book. That's, that she refers to him as compulsive. Very much of so. the way I have a relative who has uh, Asperger's. Yeah. And uh, I've known some other people who uh, live within the spectrum. They call yeah. it. And, um, that strikes me as very familiar. Yeah. That um, it's the things, the little details and things they note about people. Yeah. That strikes them as more interesting than what we would assume. Yeah. Like, not the name. Yeah. But the trait. <laughs> but the guy that laughs like a you know, is the guy that laughs like a horse. You know? Yeah. That guy. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, it's funny. Um, I had a I had a uh, friend back in the neighborhood that um, always referred to my brother's and I and some of the other neighborhood kids. They didn't, he never called us by our real names. He always, we were all represented by a name. He thought we were most closely uh, resembled to as like a superhero. You know, so uh, I have a brother who's Batman, and I got a brother who's uh, Spider-Man. And me, I was Flash. So, but I thought it was pretty funny. So You're a fast runner? No, I'm not a fast runner at all. I mean, I I think I think it's because. I don't know, Flash. You liked him? No. No, 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 no. It was he was okay. I mean, he was he was a he was a he was a, rat, he was a bit rather odd. I did like the TV show with that. Act. Flash. What's his name? I don't know. Series. I never watched the show. Yeah, you, you guys talking know, about the show. I don't know if you're into that, but there's a TV show. We've watched it somewhere. Yeah. 
that that, that one guy that did the TV show. I know the fellow that did the movie. He was kind of yeah. uh, questionable about some things in the papers. Yeah. Now, there's something else I wanted to show. Uh -huh. We talked about this um, sometime on another show a long time ago, yeah. which I don't know if it's reached. I don't think we ever got it out of the line. Okay. Uh, but there is a company named after the recording engine. His name is Ward Marston. It's called Marston Records. Marston. This guy is a genius engineer, and his passion is for digging up the old, like we were talking earlier about yeah. Hyperion doing those records. Yeah. This guy digs up the oldest, most likely forgotten, or will be forgotten, or has been forgotten, yeah. pianists. Uh, pianists, and then they opera also singers. do opera singers, yes. mostly. Um, this is the first one that you got for me. Yes, that got me interested in it, and I've got a whole bunch of things marked off that, you know, if my uh, income uh, advances yeah. in the future, I'm going to get more of these. Uh, I have a, I do, I'm a preferred customer, so I get a, yeah. at least like once every three or four yeah. months. This is the first one that you gave me as a yeah. gift. Wilhelm Kemp's complete acoustic recordings of Berlin. 1923 to 25. Yeah. The really amazing thing about these things is the quality of the recordings. As old as this stuff is, you know, it's like back in the day when you could get Pearl Records or some of that really old stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I, as, as a performance yep. artist, I say as a musician, I never had a problem. Yeah. All that noise and yeah. stuff. You try I to have some old out. 78s in my. Yeah. library and I used to have I still have a recorder a record player that'll play the yeah. 78s my wow. grandma's up there um, that doesn't bother me yeah. but what he's managed to do is with the best technology and I don't know how he does all of yeah. it really cleans the stuff up oh I'm sure and he doesn't like artificially amp it or do anything that would distort it somehow yeah. but it yeah. keeps yeah. it very, very true, which is a nice thing about yeah. the old technology, like really old glass pane photographs. There's so much depth in those ancient pictures. You know, black and white, you can see it. Like, it's amazing, the grains and stuff. Like, if you look at that photograph of Chopin Chopin 345, that's a real photograph yeah. of the real man. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's incredibly vibrant, you know? And I think the same thing is true of old recordings, I feel, from the early days. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about Edison, Edison, those roles, that kind of stuff. That's not quite there. But when they were doing the old wax uh, records, wax records cutting yeah. things with the yeah. horn and everything. Yeah. The wonderful thing about that, the old recordings of all the great singers, of course, they had to reorchestrate some stuff instead of uh, strings. Sometimes they had to use winds and brass instruments. Mm -hmm to play the parts and stuff, but there's something very true, very immediate, very just right there yeah. about those performances. And it's because fundamentally there's no filtering. Yeah. You know, you, you put the music in the horn and it will send it down through. It's miraculous. I don't know how it works, Yeah. but somehow all that goes through that steel needle, which cuts into the wax and, and it comes out. It comes out to reproduce the sounds that you yeah. Honestly, I don't know how that works. To I this don't know day, it's beyond that either. I don't know how they do that. Especially the old stuff. Yeah. How did they learn to take the vibrations, run it through a steel needle into yeah. the stuff, and somehow that records all the vibrations in a way that can be reproduced to sound like what we heard, yeah. talking or music or something like that. But the cool thing about the old stuff, in my opinion, is piano sat down and played. Yeah. That's what you got. Exactly. You know? And yeah. like when I was talking about Tchaikovsky did the Nimbus records, for example, mm -hmm. that was what they were trying to achieve with digital technology. Yeah. Because there are some weird things when they were first experimenting with CDs. Yeah. Uh, some odd stuff. Yeah. Well, so there's the camp and then uh, when I subscribed, 
uh, they were releasing Robert Goldsand. Robert Goldsand yeah. was a Viennese uh, pianist, had a huge career early on in Europe. He was Jewish, had to leave, came to the United States, ended up teaching in Indiana, right? I think, I think so. so. Yeah. What was really cool, and this is cool about it, Yeah. this is his, uh, the Lost Recitals, if you refer to it. Yeah. Uh, and then here's this CD here, which I think is the bad one. So I replaced, replaced the, the good one. Yeah. After they released the box set, they realized that there was a fault in one of the yeah. recordings. Yeah, the speed the wasn't right. Yeah, so. so this is how cool they are. They fixed it, and then they sent Send it out it. to people who had already bought the box. In my case, I got the box with the original, mm -hmm. and then they sent the corrected one. So you could exchange them if you want, but I kept the original as well. Yeah. But there's that. Yeah. Robert Goldsand. There he is. Good looking fella. <laughs> yeah, he was. Oh. Um, there she is. I know there's all of these, but there's some different ones. The cool thing is if you become a preferred customer, yeah. they send you generally what their newest project is. Yeah. I'm a piano preferred customer. Ditto. And they also have an opera singer preferred customer. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in many of those things too because I love, I have collections of old things. But they send you, what's the word they use for these? these Complimentary CDs. CDs? Yeah, but there's a special word you use for La Niappe. La Niappe. Anyway. Just show them like okay. all of these, and then some of the ones on top are some of the. They they sent oh, boy. these CDs in separate um, envelopes. Yep. There's some right. famous right. French guys here. There's uh, Bristler right. in there, and uh, actually, Ricardo Vignes. Ricardo Vignes. Premiered Ravel and Debussy. There's an interesting one if you keep going. Get Rosina. Vienna Damata. Yeah, Vienna Damata. Oh, Rosina Levine. And that's cool because Rosina she's playing Levine. chamber music with colleagues of hers at the Juilliard School. Yep. Ciappi or Chiappi? Chiappi. Chiappi. Check it out. Moreno. Movie star, right. practically. Yeah. yeah. Supposedly she was supposed to, uh, her mom and uh, Dina Lopati's mom tried to set the two of them up to get married, oh. and she never, she didn't. Um, Selva. Yeah. So, uh, I would really recommend Marston. If you're into this historic stuff like this, yeah. um, you're not listening to whistles and bops and clicks. I yeah. mean, it's incredibly Very clean, cleaned up stuff. And then you're listening to artists who would otherwise perhaps be forgotten. Yeah. But shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, there's some amazing playing in here, folks. Oh, absolutely. Now, what I'm looking forward to, I don't know if you've been um, paying attention to recordings these days, but I had recently been watching uh, The Beatles' uh, newest release. Now, now I know what you're thinking. John and uh, uh, George are, uh, passed away already, but... Uh, what happened was, I mean, they're always finding stuff oh, you know, see from these guys. Uh, if you haven't been on YouTube and checked out the the Beatles release, now and then, you should check it out. Okay? Uh, for the longest time, uh, the remaining Beatles, when George was still alive, they had been trying to, uh, you know, come back together and just come out with songs. You know, that maybe they had kept in the back doors or something that... Without John Lennon? Well, sort of, well, sort of just worked together with the ring. But however, Yoko Ono, oh. uh, about 10 years ago, had found a cassette recording of John that was of John Lennon sitting at the piano uh, for, uh, trying to record a song that he was just improvising and just making up. You know? And so uh, tape was hissy. You know, and they they said, "Let's hear it. Let's hear it." So they brought it into the studio. And they listened to it, and you know, they had a lot of trouble with the audio because it's a, it was a cassette recording. You see, I think for some of you who don't know what a rec cassette recording, just look it up. Okay. So, but anyways, 
it was very hissy and you got to hear the room noise and everything and it just seemed like you know the more they worked on it the more they couldn't get it i mean it just didn't go anywhere so they just put it off the wayside now fast forward 10 years later something like in 2021 22 uh what's the name what's the name of the guy that directed the titanic movie oh yeah i can't even say his name i can see him yeah because well, he, he he also directed the uh what is that called the those people the the, the marine guy who goes and becomes through computer stuff part of this other world of people uh, avatar avatar he yeah. did the same he was also the director. yeah he was the it's not carpenter uh, no, it's not carpenter no you know who but I, you know who I mean. yeah you know who i mean but anyways he, he built had, this huge water tank in this this <laughs> model of the titanic to yeah. that film you know? yeah but anyways He's, he dabbles he dabbles in recordings and audio and yes. audio visual things. Actually, very and so, in it. Yeah, and so he took he says he says to Paul here, let me have the cassette tape. Give me the master and I'll see what I can do. Uh, and so he said Cameron. So yeah, James, it's a James Cameron. James Cameron. James Cameron, that's yeah. his name. So, C A M E R O N. Yeah. So he takes the cassette tape and messes with it for, you know, a couple months or so, right? Yeah. And he says he calls uh, Paul over. He says, Here. He says, this is what I got for you. So they're in the studio, and he, he types in something on the computer, and he, he gives Paul the playback. And Paul is astounded. He says, it sounds like John is in the room. Yeah. And that is what I'm talking about, that the next true. level of recording. Yeah. What are they going to do? I, I, I would I would shudder to think what they could do with these. They, they, could, they could make these people come back alive. I feel that to my ears yeah. and stuff, it's sufficient that they're doing that as it is. As it is? I'm, I mean, these recordings, now some of them depends on how old they yeah. are. But um, still, I mean, there's recordings of that wrist. Isn't, a, there's a Rolf, isn't Rolf Pugno in there? If not, he's somewhere. I can't remember. Pugno, but there's yeah. a, I've had a recording of Pugno over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Pugno is in Harold Schoenberg's book about an extraordinary yeah. pianist. You hear this guy play. And this is not... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, piano roll stuff. Yeah, right. Exactly. This is real acoustic recordings, but cleaned up with the miraculous technology that we have in the 21st century. It's an, it's amazing. I don't know. I'd like to see. I still want. To, I'm still curious. To oh, there'll always be more. I know. That we I do. still want to know what's good. Uh, James Cameron is cool that way because yeah. he's a total hands-on, total everything. Oh about yeah, Absolutely. the movie. Because uh, he was the one. I'm pretty sure he's the guy that did. Avatar movies. I'm pretty sure he was and, too. Um, Definitely Titanic. I don't know that he composes, but he, he works very, very closely with all of his big people, including the people who write the music score, the soundtracks. Yeah. Make sure that it fits exactly right with the yeah. film and everything. He's a completist, like yeah. you know. So have you heard? Have you seen the video yet? Or uh, the song? Beatles. Beatles. No. It's called Now and Then. It's called Now and Then. Now that is cool. I mean, what's amazing is that since the Second World War, I mean, I think a lot of stuff disappeared. Yeah. I'm talking just the chaos. But especially like in Europe, you know, and the Nazis stealing stuff. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount of stuff that we knew about that disappeared. And then what's incredible, it just pops up here and there. I just saw an interesting news article, sadly, where U.S. court decided not to return to a Jewish family something that had been stolen by the Nazis. And there was some reason for it. Yeah. And most of the time, it, it ends up in the favor of the owners at the time, mm -hmm. especially the Jewish families that own the stuff or the art dealers, you know, yeah. for example. But I remember um, with the Velta Mignon, yes. which used to be a mechanical piano reproduction system, which was far more sensitive than your typical Aeolian piano mm -hmm. roll kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it was a German-made thing, and it went back to the very beginning of the 20th century. 
I don't think it was as old as in the 19th century. But the amazing thing is, is that there were recordings made of Gustav Mahler playing some excerpts from his Symphony. stuff. Yeah. Uh, Edvard Grieg actually performing. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, it was the little short pianist with one of the great exponents of Liszt's studio. Carl Tausig? No, Tausig. Yeah, Gene. Uh, yes. He was married to Teresa yeah. Carreño. Oh, gosh. Dalbert. 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 Dalbert is one of them. Yeah. There and this is this is fortunate uh, that years ago we, we're mostly we got some themes going here. We're talking about old the re recovery of old historical items is one of them. the International Piano Library, uh, which is held uh, and uh, held at the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. which actually has a very important piano uh, competition festival there, right? Yeah, yeah. They have, uh, but I think they have it was a combination help. between some money that ended up in, in Maryland and then California guys that had uh, Velta Mignon rolls and the instruments which could play them. Because the problem was is after the Second World War, I think, it was even in the First World War, there was some damage to the Velta Mignon factory. But then after the Second World War, it was completely decimated. And they didn't have, they thought there was a lot of stuff that was destroyed. But as things turn out, somebody with money, you know, like I'm looking at this Randolph Hearst castle yeah. book, and that guy went all over the world and collected. I mean, he had so much money. Built that massive castle and put all the art and furniture and all that stuff in it, which he found from all over the world. Americans, especially Californians, to some extent New Yorkers, with money, went to Europe and bought it up. Went to Asia, bought it up. Well, this California guy at some point had gone to Germany and discovered the Velte Mignon system. He was fascinated with it because people would say, you know, I've heard Busoni play the piano yeah. live. This sounds like the way Busoni plays the piano. There was subtleties to the way the system could reproduce. Yeah. Uh, there were little not not uh, control knobs and yeah, levers, levers yeah. and things that you could yeah. move. They were actually sometimes written into the scroll, do this up to plus three and different things like that. I had, uh, my dad for a while had a working um, Aeolian system in a Steinway upright. Huh. It had these little knobs and little things on yeah. it. And there were instructions at the beginning of the paper, set this, set this, set this. My dad was a piano technician, so the piano was in good shape. And then he had also done, didn't have to do a lot, but some necessary oofing up the player system. Yeah. But it really worked well. And sadly, he decided to sell it because oh. he wanted the money. Yeah. But I loved playing the thing because there were amazing things. You just watch the keys go and stuff. Yeah. And you could tell that by listening to the playing, even at that age I could hear, it was like a different pianist playing this piano. This yeah. way, you know. Velta Mignon was apparently way more sensitive than that. Oh. Because the way it worked, that there was a tray of uh, chemicals, I think some kind of an acid, and when you played the keys, the um, these copper rods would go down into this tray of chemicals yeah. that would electrically record the depth, the speed, and some other things, aspects, of when the key, when that rod went down into the stuff. Huh. And that would very finely translate that into commands so that when it was replayed, it would do it exactly the same way. It was an extraordinary creation. But I have a bunch of um, cassette tapes that I still yeah. have that I made from some old albums. The thing that surprised me, I haven't seen this, well, I have not been able to find the International Piano Library available like on CD. Um, I've looked for it. Maybe you guys tell me about it, but I don't know how okay. they transferred that to CD. You would think that they would want to. You, but 
uh, I know that there was money into this whole thing like back in the 70s and 80s. And then maybe the money dried up. And so now it's just a holding thing. Yeah. But can you imagine? I mean, the recordings are really good enough that uh, Gustav Mahler sits at the piano and plays some parts from his symphony. Yeah. I was going to suggest, instead of looking at a, under International Piano Library, look at under International Piano Archives. Is that what they call it? I think that's because because I've heard it called archives. archives now. Because that's um, it was under that label that we have near a chasm. Is that how they did that? Yeah. Okay. We may have looked that up. You guys, if you know anything about yeah, it, you know, yeah. Right, right. Whether it exists on our uh, Facebook page. Yeah. Well, I think we've done a good show today. Yeah. What we've been talking about is. Lots of things, <laughs> but but a lot about uh, reviving historically yeah. forgotten and lost yeah. things, and then the other issue that we talked about was um, how useful are our text editions in the hands of uninformed musicians, yes. younger naive ones, even if there's a professor who can say do it like this, do it like that, play it like this, play it like that. Um, What's the harm? And I, I yeah. mean, I was raised, I came into college, I think, about the time that the Urtex stuff was really hitting the fan. Right? Oh, yeah. So it was a big deal. I remember my master's, I brought the Schenker Beethoven to Howard when I was doing 109. He said, well, why don't you have the end line? Why, why don't you want the end line? You know, I thought Schenker is very interesting because his yeah. idea was to look beneath the filigree to the bones. Exactly. And see yeah. what's there in terms of structure. Yeah. And then, my God, you want to look at something interesting. Look at the Hans von Bülow edition and the Beethoven uh -huh. sonatas and all the notes for the Howard <laughs> Look at the Arthur Schnabel edition. There you go. That, <laughs> the Arthur wonderful. Schnabel. You, you brought those in I did bring those wonderful. in show and tell once. Wonderful ideas. I mean, why would you not want to know yeah. what Arthur Schnabel has to say about the Beethovens? Yeah, exactly. Why? I mean, they're one of the cornerstones. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the very first recording of the complete Beethoven sonatas. Probably one. And of they them. are his style. You know, is regarded as one might say characteristic. Yeah. Um, you know, rather unique kind of way of playing. But a Lechitsky student. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So why why wouldn't why wouldn't you want to rely on the experience and knowledge yeah. of people? Come on. I mean, what about the legacy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, as far as uh, Schnabel, yeah, goes to Leszczynski, yeah. who studied with, with Czerny, Czerny, who studied with Beethoven. They always have that yeah. legacy thing. Yeah. But then with um, Hans von Bülow, yeah, no kidding. who was a student of Franz Liszt, who was a student of Czerny, Czerny who was a student uh, of Beethoven. Beethoven. <laughs> and Hans von Bülow lost his wife to Wagner, but continued to... Yeah. Uh, uh, make Wagner's music you yeah. know, to perform it, and you think about the kind of intellects of people. Franz Liszt yeah. and Wagner. It's a late nineteenth century view, but how can you just dismiss the minds and the opinions and the enormously developed artistic ideas um, of such great masters at that period of time? And just say, oh no, I'd rather have. I'd rather use my own intuition and work from a completely relatively blank score, especially the farther back you go in yeah. time, and just see what Beethoven wrote down on the page. Yeah, yeah but come on, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing I learned from working with Malcolm Bilson, yeah. and I've also learned that from this book I'm reading in 19th century performance practice traditions, there were kind of universally understood gestures and the way to play those gestures. Yeah. You know, this kind of idea, like it was a particular movement or, uh, you know, a dance in a piece. Yeah. Where uh, everybody, you know, like there's not just Poles writing Mazurkas, Russians wrote Mazurkas. Mm -hmm. yeah, French yeah. guys wrote Mazurkas. Mazurkas, yeah. You know, have anybody wanted American to guys did too. Right there, Mazurkas. The Americans did too. You know, one might suggest 
an American, if he really knew Polish people and really heard from Mazurkas, he'd be fine. Gotcha. But this say, come on, gotcha. Russians, <laughs> Russians would have understood Mazurkas in their own way because yeah. they controlled a third of the country. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But uh, back in box time, for example, yeah. the really interesting thing was is that the majority of string players in the orchestras, at least in the big places, in the courts, and uh, like in Hamburg, but basically it was all controlled by the aristocracy yeah. at the time, or the royalty. Yeah. Most of those string players were trained in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? Uh, the, got the gangrene in his foot. Lully. Lully? was not French. No. It was Italian. And yeah. he had his Francophone name, Frankenstein's name, or what he thought. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is, this is also in box time. Because of the universality of um, Italian trained string players, there was a universality of string playing and a way of playing and bowing traditions and all those kinds of things because those guys all had that in common. And then if you weren't from Italy, you learned it from these guys and it became a universal tradition. So that there were common practices common understandings of the way things you know I it's true without scholarship one had to go on well this is the way it goes yeah you know I at, there was a period of my time when I used to cringe at that because I became completely converted to uh, yeah. new scholarship and all that and where it takes up well this is the way it goes <laughs> I hated that for a while but then I started to realize that until we had access to this kind of technology we're talking about, to dig this stuff up, redo it on computers, uh, re-record it, you know, filter it, and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, what you have is you learn from hopefully a reasonably great artist, or your teacher studied with a great artist, yeah. and you learn this is how it goes. Yeah, and that would have changed with taste and changing. Traditions, traditions over yeah. time, yeah. but there would have been some kind of a but also legacy an and a continuity. The instrument, yeah. yeah. And I think there's something to that, and it's interesting because now what we're doing with ancient recordings like that, and people that are really using modern scholarship to re to try to really understand yeah. pre-recording, how do they do stuff? Like Malvina Bray's uh, Leschetizky method, which he approved, all the photographs of his hands of every possible movement and gesture, very scientific. The really interesting part is the part that follows all of that physical stuff about discussion of rhythm, of, of um, articulation, yeah. of tempos, over body, pedaling, things like that. All of a sudden, when you read that in this, this is all, uh, Leschetizky was one of the greatest pedagogues in history, knew everything about piano playing in the later 19th and early 20th century. Um, he himself studied with charity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he's the one that is saying these things that she wrote down. You suddenly start to listen to those old fashioned pianists yeah. and realize it's not this kind of bullshit. Oh, they were just, you know, quack to do. You yeah, know, they just they were didn't really felt like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there were performance practices and traditions. Yeah. That that's the way you do it. That's the way it's played. That's the way it's pedaled. You know. I find that all very exciting and and kind of refreshing. Yeah. One can go, you know, in a kind of a Let's put it this way. I think that we've moved beyond the kind of vortex and the purity of archaeology within our kind of modern bias of things, cut it down to the raw bones and rebuild it to where we're now realizing that there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of things that we have access to that can help keep the flesh on the bones. Yeah. And we can interpret it joyously. I think joyously. We can interpret Chopin perhaps the way he actually played it. Certainly we can appreciate Chopin through the eyes of um, Friedman. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, through the hands of Friedman. We can also appreciate Chopin in the hands of Arthur Rubinstein. Absolutely. And not to dismiss all the other people in between, yeah. but we can uh, at some point come to appreciate Chopin in the hands of you and John Lennon. Oh, well, hopefully yeah. soon. <laughs> A lot more soon. So the I think the wonderful thing about being alive today is the catholicity, the small c, uh, universality of well-researched, well-documented, sometimes there's a certain amount of guesswork still there, but there's an allowance for intuition with reason and rational yeah. uh, decision-making to create so many possibilities and opportunities. It's like there's more room for a variety of ways of looking at things. So you listen to Yuja, you can listen to Alan. Mm -hmm. You can listen to Yun Cha. Or you can go back in time and listen to Robert Goldstein play it. Oh yeah. Or uh, Abby Simon. Abby Simon. <laughs> yeah. You know, or you can go way back and you can listen to original recordings of Company of Song mm -hmm. and Raul Pugno mm -hmm. and all these amazing That's French Rissler. pianists. Rissler? Rissler. He was, despite the name, he was French. Yeah. Um, all these people from the French piano school that seem to have disappeared, but now it turns out there were recordings in private collections yeah. that people like like Marston or Pearl Records or Opal, Opal get their hands on and they can yeah. put that stuff out there for, for our consumption to get, get those sounds again in our ears. I, I, I find it a wonderful time oh, to be alive and to hear what's possible. I mean, if you want to hear, I saw a big argument about Jonas Kaufmann versus Klaus Florian Vogt, two German tenors okay. singing Wagner. All right. Um, well, you can also go back and listen to uh, Friedrich Schnorr. Oh, yeah. Was, who actually worked with Faulkner <laughs> and did some of the original parts, <laughs> they're available in recordings, you know, and you can make a choice, you know, if you want. And you can also think, you know, what the big arguments are, there's the whole idea of the Heldon to it, like Barts Malfior in yeah. the 1930s. That was a developed technique and style, which maybe Wagner maybe was looking for, but what he had to work with was like you mentioned it earlier, like somebody like Pauline Viardot. Yeah. Everybody yeah. loved Pauline, Pauline Viardot. And Emmy Destine, the great friend of Arthur uh, Ruinstein, was a performer at Bayreuth. These people were coming out of the Bel Canto period of singing. You know, the Donizetti and, and yeah. that kind of music. That was the kind of singing which was really, and it's remained popular in French music into the middle of the 19th century thereafter, um, there must have been some changes going on with what Wagner was trying to do with his music and what he was wanting. But he was drawing on singers who were coming out of a general earlier to mid 19th century tradition of singing, which you can hear in some of these wonderful recordings of Italian singers. French singers, mm -hmm. and even some of the old German singers, you know, and, and then we have the benefit of the recordings now, so stuff is frozen in time, that we can hear the stylistic changes yeah. of uh, vocal technique and delivery, and of the, the, say, the 30s through the 50s or the 60s, and how is it changing? You know, yeah. how are things changing? Um, anyway, I'm talking a lot. But, well, uh, I have a new project for you. Exciting. I have a new project. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I had, uh, I've been uh, looking at movies at the uh, thrift store. Ooh. And one of the movies that caught my eye was uh, People You Want to Meet in Heaven. That was one of the movies that caught my eye. So, which gave me this idea. Oh, Lordy. Yes! You have like 10 people you're going to invite to the birthday party. How many? I came up with three different 10 people groups. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, this one won't be as difficult as that. Okay, I just, I, yeah. well, 
many people you want to meet now. But here, I'll just give you five. All right. Oh. Five musicians you want to meet now. I just I said musicians. Okay. So it doesn't have to be just composers. Okay. It could be, you know, pianists or violinists or uh, opera singers or so whoever. You can actually hear so, these people perform. Yeah. So five people or five musicians you want to meet at heaven. What are your five musicians? We're gonna think about it. We'll we're gonna think show. about it. Next show. So next show, you know, you could, uh, you, know, you know, put it in the comments below. Uh, oh, which reminds me, he said, if you like the content of today's episode, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're we've got a Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, at some point, if we get some money behind the project, you know, we could do a GoFundMe for Mark and Elmer's BSR. We yes, we could. I want you to research some of it through Kathy's computer so you can see what this is. Okay. We could actually do it. We're we're not out of bounds by asking for it. Usually, the way it happens through YouTube is we get followers, and then once we have enough, yeah, then people want to advertise on our yeah. page, and you get some re residual money that way. Yeah. But we could possibly possibly do go find them too. So we're thinking out loud. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll let you know if we decide to set one of those up. Because we, we'd we like to get this rolling a little bit more. Oh, absolutely. Professionally. Because we're the, we're the guys inside the donkey, you know. Sometimes one's in the front, one's in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. And that's as good as it gets right now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm trying to get these up. up. Yeah, and just subscribe, subscribe to us and, and make comments on YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube yep. and then follow us on Facebook. And uh, we hope we get some some feedback from you about things. We managed to do just well, about two hours. I think we started at thirteen forty nine and it's fifteen fifty one. So we managed to pull it in about two hours. All right, better than better than. Then uh, we sometimes yeah. actually when we turn the camera off we're still going. Yeah. But we decided that's too that's too good for you. <laughs> we want you to no that's not right. Yeah. It's too much. We realize it, and we want you to keep coming back. We're still going. We're still yeah. going. Yeah. Okay. Well, my name's well your name's Mark. My name's Elmer, and we are PSI, PSI. Piano Scene Investigations. We'll see you next time. That went well. Yeah.